Our Voices of Experience speaker series for the Daniels College of Business is meant to bring CEOs and significant leaders to our community so that we can learn about their triumphs, we can learn about their mistakes, and we can learn about the lessons that they've learned as they've moved through their leadership careers. We've had an amazing series this year. We started off with Barbara O'Brien, Lieutenant Governor of Colorado, Peter Swinburne, CEO of Molson Coors. We had Patty Gabo and Donna Lynn in our healthcare panel. We had Stephen Chipman, the CEO of Grant Thornton. We also have tonight Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, and we will be ending our series with Andy Taylor, the CEO of Enterprise. Next year promises to be as exciting. Already we have lined up the CEO of Visa, the CEO of US Bank, and the CEO of REI. I want to take a moment to thank the organizations that help bring this series to our community because it is their commitment to leadership and to having impact that has made this possible. This series is free of charge and open to the entire community because of the generous sponsorship of many organizations, and I would like to recognize them right now. Our funding sponsors include Grant Thornton, First Bank, CoBank, and the Rocky Mountain Human Resource Planning Society. Our in-kind sponsors include Chase, National Association of Corporate Directors, Ethosphere Magazine, Denver Metro Chamber, Net Impact, and the Marketing Roundtable at Daniels. Please help me in thanking these organizations for their leadership and impact. <laughs> Tonight we're very lucky. We have two significant people that will be up here on our stage tonight. Of course, Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, will be our keynote speaker. But we also have a facilitator for tonight's session who also is quite the leader and has had significant impact, Dr. Jim O'Toole. Dr. O'Toole is a distinguished business ethics chair in the Daniels College of Business. As I asked him tonight, I said, how many books have you actually written? He said, oh, I don't know, somewhere around 17 or so. He's quite humble, quite accomplished. Let me just read to you a couple of the significant moments that he's had in his career and the impact that he's had. Dr. O'Toole is known by Ethosphere Magazine as one of the most 100 top influential people in business ethics. He's been cited by Leadership Excellence Magazine as one of the top 100 people in thought leadership on the topic of leadership. And he's also been recognized by Strategy and Business as one of the most influential authors in leadership. It's quite significant. He's a thought leader. We're very proud that he's one of our faculty members here in the Daniels College of Business. He's helping us lead the Institute for Enterprise Ethics and the Carl Williams Business Partnership in Ethics and is really leading the way as we carve our path and continue to focus on ethics, leadership, significance of character, and thought leadership in this area. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim O'Toole to the stage. Now, I hope my machine is on. It is, yes. Okay, good. Right. Now, if you ask uh, anybody over the age of about 50, who invented coffee, the chances are they would say it was Howard Schultz. And you know, they'd only be exaggerating slightly. Uh, just like you want to harken back to those uh, terrible old days when, when we wanted a cup of joe, what we had to do was to go to the local greasy spoon. Um, what we got there was an absolutely vile liquid. It tasted a little bit like battery acid. <laughs> and it was probably served lukewarm in a styrofoam cup. And uh, the only way you could make it palatable was to uh, put about a half pint of cream in it and about seven or eight teaspoons full of, uh, of sugar. So uh, as far as um, America's coffee was concerned, the whole world took great pity on us. Now, um, but they did forgive us, though, because they understood that the reason why we had such a miserable brew was because, frankly, it was ignorance. Um, at that time, only a very fortunate small number of Americans who had the chance to travel in Italy 
and uh, of course, probably a few beatniks who hung around in coffee houses in Greenwich Village and in North Beach. They're about the only ones who ever really had a taste of the real, real thing. Uh, but then along came Starbucks in the 1980s, when it might be said that Howard Schultz democratized the uh, access to great coffee. Now, in a flash, it seemed that there was a Starbucks everywhere. In fact, if you were in Manhattan, there were three on every block. Uh, all told, there were about 17,000 stores uh, worldwide. Now, in the process, we Americans went from being provincials to sophisticated coffee drinkers. And what was so marvelous about the whole thing is that we became bilingual in the process. <laughs> or at least we could fake a little Italian. Por favore, barista, tre venti latte, e due grandi cappuccini per me, amici, e uno doppio campana per me, uh, grazie bene. <laughs> we can all do it. Now, so successful was Starbucks that its founder, Howard Schultz, felt that he could kick himself upstairs and turn over the operating reins of the company to a successor CEO. And indeed, it was a marvelous time. We were all in Java heaven. Until late 2007, when Starbucks hit the wall. Now, sales rapidly declined, largely as a result of the terrible recession that led to lower consumption of premium coffees. By 2008, all those naysayers in Wall Street were predicting Starbucks doom. They were perhaps even talking about a hostile takeover by that arch villain of fast foods, Mickey D's. Um, then, when all seemed lost and the coffee drinkers started to despair, suddenly an unmasked hero appeared on the scene. He was faster than a speeding bullet and smarter than a carload of Harvard MBAs. It was, in fact, Super Schultz. In a flash, he un uh, retired himself, and he took control of Starbucks. And when that announcement came up, it was at that moment, my friends, that moment, my friends, that I bought stock <laughs> in Starbucks. Yes! Now, of course, we all know what happened next. Uh, Howard masterfully led a successful organizational transformation, and lo and behold, Starbucks is now back. It's back, and it's better than ever, it's stronger than ever, and more profitable than ever. Now, what all these events reconfirm is that Howard is the greatest innovator of our age. Today, we have to understand that innovation is less about technology and a lot more about giving consumers novel and valued experiences. And in creating a new institution at Starbucks, indeed in creating a whole new industry, Howard brought that special Starbucks experience to all of us. In sum, he is a brilliant entrepreneur, he's a brilliant innovator, he's a master of corporate change, and now, we found out today he is the author of the number one best-selling nonfiction book in America. Now, if you don't believe me about all that stuff that I've just said, catch this video. No company is immune from the impact of the recession, not even the one-time darling of Wall Street, Starbucks. After 37 years of growth, Starbucks is struggling to put the mo back in its joke. The number one threat facing America, Starbucks. Then for a cup of coffee, and they want you to buy a sandwich and a book and a DVD. In a memo to his top executives, Howard Schultz admitted changes have led to a dilution of the experience and a loss of the romance and theater of Starbucks, opening the door to competitors. This must be eradicated. Yesterday, it was concluded that I would be coming back as chief executive officer. I can see the light. I know what we have to do. We have to show up. We have to do the work. And what doing the work means is that we have to find answers to tough problems. I apologize. If anyone in this room feels that we have fractured the culture and values of the company by what has happened over the last few weeks, it's a decision that we had to make. Together, we have to turn this page. We have to go forward. We want to go back to what we really stand for, and we want to provide our customers and our people a sense of pride and confidence in the authenticity of the Starbucks experience. We have a lot of work to do but our research tells us we're making real progress. 
on every measure of customer satisfaction. There'll be more stores in the next year that'll be very, very different, but much more exciting and obviously much more relevant than the stores we built 10 years ago. Starbucks' best days, I truly believe, are in front of us. We have some of the finest people in the world serving our coffee in our stores. We are ethically sourcing the highest quality coffee in the world. I know that to be true. We have built one of the most recognized and respected brands in the world. And I believe sincerely in the future of our company because I believe in all of you. And now, on behalf of the Institute for Enterprise Ethics, I am honored to present to you the man who invented coffee as we know it, <laughs> Howard Schultz. Welcome, Howard. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very high-tech stool. <laughs> Good evening. And uh, thank you so much for coming. I, I was just told that there's hundreds of other people in some other place. I don't know where you are, but uh, uh, thank you for, for coming this evening. Uh, I guess this is my seventh city in about eight days. And uh, I've gotten to speak to uh, very enthusiastic groups of people. And uh, this is the largest crowd, I guess, that I've had. So thank you so much for your enthusiasm for Starbucks and coming out to hear me speak. I hope I can meet your expectations. Um, let me begin by, by saying something that perhaps is not uh, generally talked about in business. And it's a word that I use to uh, categorize one of the chapters in the book. Uh, it's not a word that uh, generally is used in business schools or in business classes, and it's love. Uh, I've been at Starbucks almost 30 years. And I came back to the company in January of 08 uh, because of unbridled enthusiasm and love and affection for the company and 200,000 people who wear the green apron and my deep responsibility to them and their families to restore the company back uh, to its rightful place. And other than my family, I can honestly say that there isn't anything that I would not do to defend this company and certainly enhance its standing in the marketplace. But the truth of the matter is that uh, we suffered through uh, a self-induced level of mistakes coupled with a cataclysmic financial crisis, uh, which I think uh, brought about the perfect storm of pressure and anxiety and significant problems for the company. And uh, uh, prior to that, uh, I, I did something in February of 07. Uh, it was something that I did many, many times, but this was a little bit different. Uh, I had written an, a, a memo to the uh, senior team of the company expressing my concern about uh, issues that I felt were undermining the company's values and what we stand for in terms of putting the customer at the center of everything we do and valuing and respecting the people who we call partners who work for Starbucks. Um, and what happened is I wrote this ironically on Valentine's Day 07, and a few days later, uh, despite the fact that I have done this many times, I was told, there was a knock on my door, and someone said, uh, you, you better put your seatbelt on because we, we got a real problem. And the problem was that the memo was leaked by someone in the company. And uh, overnight, there was unbelievable uh, problems that was created by the, the memo. And specifically, it was viewed as an indictment from me to the management team of the company. It was not meant as an indictment, uh, but I could no longer be a bystander. Now, uh, I had given up the CEO title many years before. And even though I was not the CEO, as the chairman of the company, uh, I was as culpable as anyone else in the problems that were created. And uh, I've tried to be as transparent as I possibly can in writing the book to serve as a, a model and for other people to learn from the mistakes that we made. And I want to share with you with great transparency right in front of you that uh, we did something not by design, 
but something happened to the company. For 15 consecutive years as a public company, we were on this magical carpet ride in which everything we literally touched turned to gold. And uh, every city we opened, every country we opened, every new product, everything we did. And uh, somewhere along the line, a, a virus uh, entered the company. And the virus was entitlement. And it began, it, it began to surface as a sense of invincibility and hubris. And uh, no one woke up one day and said, you know, we're, we're invincible. We can do anything. But a mentality started growing in the company in which the growth and the success started covering up mistakes. But because the stock price was so high, and the world had determined that we were the kind of company that was a darling of Wall Street, the company became somewhat complicit with our PE, the stock price, and not by design, but just it evolved, that we started measuring and rewarding the wrong things. And when I wrote that memo, I could smell it. I could smell that we were heading for a collision course with time and that something was going to happen. The memo, because it was leaked, in a perverse way became a catalyst for very honest dialogue. Now, I want to rewind the clock just for a moment, and then I'll get back to that period. Starbucks Coffee Company, uh, in a very unique way, not better than any other company, uh, set out to build a different type of business model. And that business model was based on core values that specifically was designed to achieve the fragile balance between profitability and a social conscience. It's important that you understand that the foundation of the company was created in a very unique way. And, uh, and that uniqueness in, 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 in a very... Uh, in a way that is hard to understand, but I'll try and explain it, uh, is linked to me, not because of my ego or my strength of conviction, but what I experienced as a young child. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, for those of you on the East Coast, you would be familiar with the term the projects. For those of you on the West Coast, uh, it's federally subsidized housing. And my dad never made more than $20,000 a year. We were a blue-collar, uh, lower-class family. The rent, when I was a kid, that my parents were paying was $96 a month for a one-bedroom apartment. And uh, it was a tough childhood. When I was seven years old, I came home from school, 1960. And uh, I walked in, and my father was spread on a couch uh, with a cast from his waist to his ankle. Uh, he had a terrible, he had a series of really bad jobs, but this one particular job was probably the worst. He was a, uh, a diaper delivery man before the invention of Pampers. You can imagine. And he fell on a sheet of ice and broke his hip and an ankle. And in 1960, if you were a blue-collar worker uh, and you got hurt on a job, you were basically dismissed. There was no workman's compensation. There was no health insurance. And we were just, uh, I was witnessing at the age of seven, literally the fracturing of the American dream. And, and I witnessed what my parents went through in terms of my father's self-esteem and just what it was like to be left behind. Now, I never imagined my wildest dreams that a kid from Brooklyn on the other side of the tracks would one day be in a position to be part of a great company or certainly be in a position to build a great company. But once I was... I realized that that imprinting moment at the age of seven in 1960 uh, needed to be linked to something for the future of our company. And in a way, I wanted to try and build the kind of company that my father never got a chance to work for. So almost 26 years ago, Starbucks became the first company in America to provide comprehensive health insurance and equity in the form of stock options to every single employee, including part-time workers. That was a huge, huge commitment on our part 
And we did that when we were a private company still losing money. Fast forward, that benefit today will cost Starbucks this year $256 million. Our largest single line item on our income statement, other than, the pri and other than green coffee for the whole corporation. OK. Fast forward. Now I've written the memo, and uh, we're now having a series of very honest conversations. And all of a sudden, the music stops playing. And the number one metric that Wall Street uses to evaluate the health and strength of a public retail company or a restaurant company is something called comp store sales. Have you heard of it? It's, a, it's an albatross. It's an albatross because it's an important metric, but not the most important one for me. But basically what it does is it measures the sales revenue uh, as, as a percentage of year, last year's anniversary. So you really are analyzing whether or not a store open more than one year is growing. And when I said earlier we were measuring and rewarding the, one, the wrong thing, and we became complicit with Wall Street, what had happened was that we were doing everything humanly possible to feed the beast of comp store sales. And we were measuring sales per hour, transactions per hour, and doing everything we can for growth. New stores as well as growing existing ones. And there's nothing wrong with that if it's balanced with making sure that the, the customer is at the center of everything you do. And that wasn't the case. When the music stopped playing, I realized that uh, as the chairman, I, I, I wanted to support the management team and I wanted to report, you know, support the CEO, but I, I had no power to really influence anything. And it became clear that things were getting much worse. So in January of 08, uh, I returned as CEO. Uh, there were some people who were chairing that, and there were a lot of people who said they should shoot the board. Uh, they don't need the founder to come back. They need a professional CEO to manage this company. Now, I came back before the cataclysmic financial crisis really raised its head, but once it did, Starbucks for some reason became the poster child for excess. And McDonald's announced a $150 million advertising campaign and a billion five capital campaign to build McCafes. And Wall Street, in their divine wisdom, had decided this is it for Starbucks. It's over. And the media jumped on. Wall Street jumped on. Customers began to question us. And all of a sudden, in a period of months, the stock price was in a peril, perilous spiral down. And we were in the process of losing $21 billion in market value in less than 10 months. And it was, it was serious. So what do I do? You know, uh, managing through a crisis versus being the entrepreneur that helped build the company is a very, very dis different discipline. When you're building a company, you have such enthusiasm and such vision and you have the wind at your back because you're just, all you see is just the bright lights. And uh, especially when you have a little bit of success and traction. When you're managing through a crisis, the headwinds are just unbelievable. And coupled with the financial crisis, there was no navigational instruments, no blueprint. Uh, I was calling everyone I knew for help and honestly no one had any idea how bad it would get in terms of the consumer spending and the economy and the recession and unemployment, and it was dire. And then I began to ask questions, now that I was the CEO again, about what was really going on in the company. And every time I'd ask a question or uncover a rock, metaphorically, I really found things that I thought were worse than I thought. The thing that really troubled me was as I began to visit stores, and taste the coffee, and understand how we were making the perfect shot of espresso or steaming milk, I was, uh, I was really depressed that we had completely lost the art and love and romance of coffee. And so I did something that was really unorthodox, and I don't think that any other national retailer had ever done it before. And when I announced it, they wanted to shoot me. And I announced that we were going to close all our stores throughout North America, 11,000 stores for retraining. Can you imagine? 
the competition used that as just, they smell blood. And they used that every single way to demonstrate that Starbucks was completely screwed up and lost their way. Wall Street said, if they're closing stores for retraining, we got to get out of the stock. The media just destroyed us. And a lot of self-doubt in the company. But what I realized during the crisis is that the number one issue for the leader was being honest, authentic, transparent, and truthful about what the situation really was. And I knew we could not transform the company if we didn't go back to the core of really why we existed in terms of coffee. So we, tra we, we retrained 115,000 people. After we did that, I think we began to demonstrate our love and commitment to making the perfect cup of coffee for our customers. But the economy was still raging havoc across the country, and we were really feeling it. We had negative store comp store sales for the first time in our history, at negative eight and then negative nine. And the board had asked me to model negative 15 and negative 20, and there were many national retailers that had double-digit negative comps. When we started modeling negative 15, we realized that the company was not going to make it if we got to that level. And we were at negative nine, we didn't really know if it was going to get worse or better. So we decided to do something, again, that was highly unorthodox. And again, they wanted to shoot me. And that was the most important person in the entire company is the store manager. And the question I asked myself is, how can we get 11,000 store managers in one place so we can talk specifically about the situation and their role and responsibility in helping to turn it around? Now, when we rolled up the numbers, it was $32.5 million to have this meeting. Travel, food, logistics. You're not having a meeting like that for an hour. You're really going to do something. But it wasn't a celebration. When we announced the meeting, every municipality in the country wanted the meeting because no company in America was traveling. Remember that time it was just, things were just shut down? We had a bake-off where municipalities came to Seattle and presented the opportunity for us to come to their city. As soon as we met the people from New Orleans, we realized that our values were linked to the people who were left behind by Katrina. And before we had our meeting, we went to New Orleans and committed 50,000 hours of community service, mostly in the Ninth Ward, to give back. And I'm talking about real work that was measurable and people really got dirty. It rekindled and galvanized people to understand the original foundational mission and proposition of Starbucks. Building a company with a conscience and a soul. Building a company that did not leave its people and the communities it served behind. And then we had our meeting. Now, I was now in front of 11,000 people. And I realized if we were going to spend this much money, this was the moment that we had to convey what was really going on and what we needed from them. I wrote an outline for what I was going to talk about, and I shared it with a few of my colleagues. And there was real concern that what I was about to say, in terms of sharing how desperate the situation was, was really going to scare people. And scare them so much that they were just going to be, I think, frightened about where we were as a company. And once again, I, I felt very strongly that everyone in the company needed to have as much information as I did about how desperate the situation was. So I laid out the facts that if we get to negative 14, negative 15 percent comps, we may not make it. But what does it really mean? I also apologized in front of everybody that I felt as leaders we had let them and, and their families down. But I promised them that with their help, we would transform the company and bring it back. But I had to ask for something specific. And I asked a question about what it means not to be a bystander. And I, I said, you know, there's thousands of customers that come through our stores every day, and it's no longer enough to do nine out of 10 things well or eight out of 10 things well 
In fact, if one thing goes wrong, we cannot afford this point and never again to allow a sea of mediocrity to enter the doors of Starbucks. We've now retrained all of you and 115,000 people, and we have to absolutely not be a bystander. And if you see something that's inconsistent with the quality of this company, its heritage, its tradition, and our collective responsibility, and you ignore it and you become a bystander, then you are now part of the problem. And then I said, I want to talk to you about what it means to take things personally, really personally. And I said, listen, we have 17,000 stores, and we're serving 60 million customers a week. But for too long, we've been talking about it at 30,000 feet in a very lofty way. It's not about 17,000 stores. It's about one store, one extraordinary cup of coffee, and the ability of you and your people to exceed the expectations of the customer. And if we do that thousands of times every single day, we will be in a position to turn the company around. But taking it personally means this. Success is not an entitlement. It has to be earned and earned every day. And if you want to know what's at stake, then let me tell you, if this gets significantly worse, the essence of how you are providing for your family is going to be taken away. The food on your table is in danger. Don't do it for me. Don't do it for 11,000 people. Do it for yourself and your family. And take it personally. I also said in private meetings with more senior people, this is a monumental task. And I'm going to ask all of you to do things that you've never done before. But I'm not going to ask anything of you that I'm not asking of myself. But if you intuitively really don't believe that we can turn things around, if you don't believe in the mission and the values, if for whatever reason this isn't what you want to do, tell me now. And we'll have a very private, respectful conversation because it'll be a much more different conversation if I come to you. Nine of the 11 direct reports I inherited in January of 08 were gone in six months. And I think in a crisis, a leader has to be very decisive because the company and its people are relying on your decision making. The innovation that came, coupled with the renewed level of commitment and passion, began to, I think, create a sea change in the company. First off, we came out of New Orleans on fire. And it was the first time where I really felt, I wouldn't say the wind at our back, but a little bit of breeze, that people are starting to believe and get it. It never got worse than negative 9%. And we came out of New Orleans, and we began to see a little bit of traction in improvements. Now, it's not enough to have passion and commitment. You've got to have the right strategy. But the, the right strategy is not enough if it's not coupled with the kind of commitment and passion I'm talking about, as well as relevant innovation. And I think what I'd like to just do is just take a step back from the problems of Starbucks and transformation and just talk about the seismic change for a moment in consumer behavior and how that relates to Starbucks and perhaps many of your own businesses. There are three separate things going on, in my view, that are affecting consumer behavior. And we are witness to a, a real change in how they're operating. The first is the economy and the downturn of the economy and the recession has a long tail. And even if the economy improves, uh, the customer is not going to respond, and a light switch isn't going to go off and say, things are now better. In fact, I don't believe the economy is going to improve that much in the next year or so, if at all. So as a result of less money to spend and pressure on the consumer, every company in America has to create a value proposition along with what they stand for. And if you are in a premium business like Starbucks, it's very hard because you've got to straddle two fences creating value and maintaining your premium position. So the first is the effect of the economy. The second, and things that I think we're all aware of, is the seismic change 
as a result of social and digital media. The rules of engagement in marketing a brand or a company today are dramatically different than they were in the past. And that train has left the station. It's not coming back. And I don't think most companies have enough money to spend on traditional marketing. So you have to create investment and capability and resources and understanding how to leverage these channels. That's the second. The third, and things that I think are not talked about as much, but really as vital as anything else, is the fact that we have parity in the marketplace. We all have competition. As a result of that parity, the consumer has lots of choices, and because of the web and social media, they're highly informed. Customers are not only going to make decisions on what things cost, or the features and benefits of the product, or convenience. They're going to make choices on values. And we're witnessing, we're, we're, we are a witness to it. And that is, the consumer is making choices every single day based on the ethics, the values, and the integrity of the organization. How you treat your people, your involvement in the community. And those companies that have like-minded values to the consumer are the choices that they want to make and they will make. And I'm not talking about issuing a press release or writing a check. I'm, I'm talking about making a declaration in the company in which the strategic relationship with regard to having a social conscience is as important as anything else you do. Those are three seismic changes. It's going to get a little water. The, the other thing that I think is going on, and I talked about this in New York and got criticized for it, is the role of a corporation. And um, let me start with, I spent the last two days in the state of California. And while I was there, I was told that California is roughly about $50 billion in debt and facing insolvency. How many people have businesses in California? There's a lot of bad stuff coming. Uh, and if we look at Wisconsin and Ohio, uh, irregardless of whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, the issues are the following. Half the states in America are facing insolvency, and two-thirds two of the states in America have budget deficits. What happened in Wisconsin and Ohio no matter where you are in the political spectrum, is the following. The legacy costs of the responsibility of states on a go-forward basis and their responsibility at the local, state, and federal level to social services are going to be examined in ways that we've never seen before, and we're going to be witness to acute cuts. Acute. And those cuts are going to have a profound impact on our lives. And the question I think that we have to ask is, what is the role and responsibility of the corporation? And I would submit very strongly, first and foremost, the employee and the relationship we have with our employees as a corporation is, is going to have to be valued at a much higher level than before. Because there's going to be such significant cuts that people are going to be facing a new order. And it's coming. And I think as it relates to the social responsibility of the communities we serve, corporations are going to have to realize that they're going to have to do more for the communities they serve. Now, this is going to have a profound impact on profitability. And we're going to see Wall Street and shareholders and investors examine this. But if corporations do not step up, the future relationship we have with our own people and the communities we serve are really going to be under a microscope and be threatened because the states at a federal and local level are just not going to be able to do the things they've done in the past. And when I talk about this, I talk about it in relationship to also the consumer. And I think the consumer is going to be making judgments in the future about those companies that do the right thing. Now, in the last 12 months, We've had record revenue and record profit as a company. Um, last quarter was the best quarter in our history. And we are two or three dollars away from the all-time high in the stock price. Two hours ago, I was in front of about 600 Starbucks partners in a meeting we had here. And one of my messages was the following. It would be tragic if we don't learn from the lessons of the last two years. 
And what were the lessons? The lessons clearly are that you've got to earn success and earn it every day, and that you cannot take success for granted. And you must exceed the expectations of our customers every day. But there's something else. And that is that you, the human condition and human behavior is when you are starting to feel successful and you come out of a desperate situation, there's a tendency to relax and almost take a bow. There's no victory lap at Starbucks and there's no one celebrating. And the challenge I think we have as a company is instilling and imprinting this level of intensity, commitment, passion on an ongoing basis when now we are succeeding again. We also have other challenges, and that is we are a large organization with 200,000 people, and we are a ubiquitous organization in terms of the footprint of Starbucks. How do you get big and stay small? How do you maintain your intimacy with your people and your customers? And what I would say is, as I look at the, all of the disciplines within the Starbucks management system, marketing, manufacturing, IT, finance, all of it, the most important discipline for me, and one that must have a seat at the, every strategic conversation, is human resources. It is the key component to being able to attract and retain great people. It's a key component to being able to understand what it means to invest ahead of the growth curve and make sure that you are attracting and retaining the right people. There's also something else that I like to say, and that is we see lots of people with lots of skills and experience, but we, wanna, we want to manage the company with people who have like-minded values. And we have made hiring mistakes in the past. And as leaders, I think for, for whatever reason, we don't, we don't want to admit a mistake when we've hired the wrong person. And, and we try as best we can to, to change the person, modify the behavior. Uh, I, I can count on one hand how many times I've seen a person change in 30 years at Starbucks. And I think you have to have the courage to realize when you've made a hiring mistake to stand up and say, it's time for this person to go. Because if you don't, and most people don't, you wait six months, you wait for a year, and all of a sudden, you finally have the conversation. You've now wasted a year. The person leaves. He's, he's absolutely affected it in a poisonous way throughout his, the organization. And now you've got to go out and find a new person. You've lost more than a year. And it affects everybody. So I think understanding human behavior, understanding what's at stake, and realizing that uh, great companies are not based on great strategies. Great companies that are enduring and sustainable are based on great people who have like-minded values, who are all pointed in the same direction and are selfless and understand that success is best when it's shared. I also want to make the point about what it means to be an entrepreneur. We're a large organization. This company was founded in an entrepreneurial way. Not only did we lose our way when we were growing so fast, but bureaucracy somehow became the rule at Starbucks. Great entrepreneurs in small or large organizations understand what it means to have a healthy level of curiosity. And by that I mean to be able to see around corners and anticipate what's coming and to link that curiosity with the courage to execute, the courage to take a big swing. And we've done things, some things have not worked, but we've also done things that people said, this is an example of another Hail Mary pass that won't work. We took the instant coffee category, a $24 billion category that had not had any innovation to speak of in 50 years, and we've reinvented it. We reinvented it because of quality, a form factor, packaging, and all the things that we brought to bear. It also, I think, again, galvanized the organization and reminded people of what it means to be an entrepreneur, even in a large organization. And I think we all have to understand that the future of our organizations is not only based on serving the customer, but people want to work for a company that they're excited about, that they believe in, that they trust. And I think being a leader today requires a much different set of requirements. I would also say that I think we're taught as men to be aggressive and be macho and perhaps not show vulnerability and emotion. 
We're living at a time in America where there's been such a fracturing of trust. Trust in banks, trust in corporate, corporate America, trust in the government. People are so hungry for truth and authenticity. The leader of an organization, small or large, must stand up to your people and tell the truth. Not some of the time, but all of the time. And trust that your people can absorb the truth and as a result of that, the organization will understand because we will all have the same level of information, we will all be in alignment, and we will all understand our role and responsibility in facing the issues and challenges. We all have challenges. We all have issues. The economy is probably not going to get any better. We're going to all have to navigate through tough waters. But those tough waters, I think we can get through because of the quality of the people that we surround ourselves with. And that means attracting the kind of people who have like-minded values and have a skill base and experience beyond our own and share the success with your people. Great companies are not based on one person, not based on a few, and great companies, I believe, have to understand what it means to achieve the fragile balance between profitability and a social conscience. Thank you very much. How are we doing? That was fantastic. Oh, okay. It really was. The only, the only thing that was better was your book. <laughs> you know, I want to tell you, the book is really dramatic. I mean, you, you, it's high drama. Your business books aren't high drama. I mean, some of them are tragedies and some of them are comedies, but very few of them are high drama. So it's, it's, really, uh, it's, it's, it's really marvelous. You know, one of the words you used towards the end of your talk tonight, and a word that, that runs all the way through your book, is this word discipline. And I mean, you must use it 50 times in the book. And you talk about the fact that Starbucks needs to pursue disciplined growth. Now, to most people, most observers, disciplined growth is you know, almost an oxymoron. You know, uh, you know, it seems almost part and parcel of, of capitalism for there to be irrational exuberance when things are going well, and it's followed by you know, overexpansion and, and, you know, and, and, and then a bust. Um, Lots of CEOs in the past have talked about discipline growth, but very few of them have ever achieved it. How is it what does it really mean to start? What are you going to really do to get discipline growth? Well, it, you know, when, when it comes down sure. to just the practical stuff, how are you going to achieve it? Well, if you accept the premise that growth at times covers, covers up mistakes, and we live through that, I think uh, what, what it means to me is that most companies, especially high growth companies, only look forward, and very few look back. If we would have looked back during the period of hypergrowth, we would have discovered that there were serious mistakes that were, were made. So I think first off, metaphorically, you've got to be willing to look forward and look back. But um, I, I think the kind of growth that we're now talking about is measuring the kind of investments that we're making with very strict guidelines in terms of return on investment and not betting the company on certain initiatives. And I, I just think that the, the kind of growth that we're now entering is not only a growth of our stores, but we're also building a new kind of business, which is the CPG business in grocery. And I just think that uh, we've learned a great lesson that will, never repeat it, will, that will never be repeated again. Well, you know, some of the cynics in the business press have said, you know, I know Howard Schultz is saying that, but look, look, let's look at their growth in China today. Said, Aren't they doing exactly in China yeah. what they did in the, you know, in, in the 90s in, in the U.S.? Uh, well, we've been in China for 12 years. We have 800 stores there. Uh, the opportunity in China is now being created and executed by a Chinese team who's local. local. And uh, the kind of growth that we have in China is about 100 stores a year versus 1,000 that we're opening in the U.S. in our hypergrowth. The size of the prize in China for Starbucks is massive, where we think we can have thousands of stores. There also is lots of people coming in, lots of competitors, and we think we understand the market after making certain mistakes. We now have a, a fantastic foundation to build on, and we're, we're, we're certainly not going to accelerate the growth in China 
at a point where we would in any way uh, not learn the lessons from the past. But we think we can have thousands of stores there, and it is our most profitable market at the unit level today. One of the, the prices that Starbucks paid as a result of the undisciplined growth was downsizing. Uh -huh. and, um, and that started right in your own headquarters. I mean, you mentioned today that nine yeah. of your 11 people left, including the CEO who was your chosen successor. Yeah. Okay. What are you doing different today than you did before so that one of these days you are going to leave mm -hmm. and so that you won't have to come back and rehire yourself a second time? I mean, what, what, yeah. How are you developing these people differently than you did before? Right. Well, I, I think I, I have to take personal responsibility for getting su succession wrong last time. But we hired a great CEO who was a wonderful person. In, in retrospect, I don't think he was set up for success as we were heading into a financial crisis. Um, I've committed to the board that I'm here to see this through. I'm not leaving anytime soon. And, and I, I now believe that the future CEO of Starbucks should come from within because the culture and the sensibilities you need to understand about the value proposition of Starbucks inside and out, I don't think can be taught in the short term by an outsider. What I want to avoid is I don't want anyone running for office today inside the company. Uh, but, I, but I have to take responsibility for what went wrong, and I also have to take responsibility. I have to get that right, and of all the things that I'm charged with right now, I think that is a top three, top five issue that has to be uh, executed perfectly. It's often said that one of the prime tasks of the CEO is to develop the, the people who, who reports to him or her. Um, in terms of development, what, what does development mean to you with, with the people who, who are your top managers? What is, how do you go about developing them? Uh, when someone is hired from the outside right now at a senior position at Starbucks, they go through approximately four months of immersion. Mm -hmm. Four months. Now, after the fourth week, they are biting at the bit to get out because they want to get in position. And, and we take them through levels of working in stores and really understanding what it is we do. Now, after four months of coming out of immersion, they are dying to do something big. And my advice to them is, you are, you've been hired because we believe in you and your talent. And for you to land softly within the organization culturally, don't try and take a big swing. In fact, mm -hmm. just try and hit a single. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I think that uh, Starbucks, our culture is not better than anyone else, but it's quite unique. The culture, in a sense, self-selects people and audits people out. And we've seen that over and over. The development of people inside the company at all levels has to build the cultural sensitivity and respect for the things that have come before them as well as the future. And then I think uh, in terms of the senior team, there has to be rotations within the disciplines of the company so that people are well-rounded. Now, nine of, the, of my direct reports have been with the company less than two years. Mm -hmm if you can believe that. Mm. And so we are in the early stages of this. Mm. Uh, but I think going back to removing the nine, it was clear to me that what it was going to take and what they believed in were two polarized points of view. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, this raises the question of your future. And I know you don't want people running for office, and I've asked you to say how much longer are you going to stay. Yeah. We're not going to go there. But you are 57 years old. In today's world, you're a kid. I wish I were only 57 years old. Um, you have the example in Seattle, your example of uh, Bill Gates, mm -hmm. who topped a fantastic corporate career with now maybe even a more fantastic philanthropic career. Um, do you have any kind of second act in mind for you? I mean, did you have some desires to do some things in other arenas where you, where you haven't done them before? Yeah. Uh, I, I honestly can't think beyond my responsibility at Starbucks today. Uh, but I think when the time comes for me to leave Starbucks, I'll know it. And I, I, I have no ambitions to do anything bigger than what I'm doing now. And I don't think anything has been as important as the work we've done the last two years. 
Now, um, in several of the interviews that you've given, you have talked about becoming a different kind of leader than you were before. Now, uh, I don't know if I want to put this as delicately as no, it's possible, okay. but uh, you know, in the past, um, your leadership was characterized as, shall we say, a bit impatient. Um, I'm still impatient. impatient. Okay, but how, have, how are you different, though? How are you different? How, how are you actually, yeah. as a leader, in, in how you behave with your followers, wh what's the difference between right. the old Howard and the new yeah. Howard? I'm going to answer the question, but I'm also going to say how I'm the same. Okay. Is that okay? Okay, good. Let me go the same first. That would be easier. Um, when I sat down with the, the, uh, the, 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 the team that was going to try and create instant coffee for Starbucks, I asked them a very simple question. How long is it going to take? And they told me two and a half years. And I said, bullshit. <laughs> it's a bit impatient, yeah. There's, there's no way we have two and a half years. Uh, the iPod was developed in a year and a half from scratch. And I said, we want, I want this product in the market in less than a year and a half. What are the resources you need and what are the barriers that exist? Because we're going to remove them. And in a year and a half, less than a year and a half, we were in market. So you're going to get what you measure and reward. And I think people can do things, the people are capable of doing bigger and, and more things than they think, and people want to be part of something larger than themselves. And I think that was a, a good example. Now, I was the same because we were in a desperate situation and we didn't have two and a half years. How I'm different, in the entrepreneurial days of building the company, it was more about me and my leadership. Because I didn't have a lot of skilled people around me. We couldn't afford them. We now have a world-class team. There's more of a consensus. There's more of a, of a creative debate, sometimes tension. I don't have all the answers, and I think I'm much more willing to yield to others. And I've done it countless times. But at the same time, someone's got to make a decision. And someone has to be willing to have the responsibility if that decision is wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I write in the book that I blew completely. I made a huge mistake where during the height of the crisis, I was searching for a silver bullet. And I thought I found it in Italy. And I rushed it to market. I, I, in California, it was a disaster, a train wreck. And I owned it completely. And I, I learned a great deal. And as a result of that, Starbucks Via was made in a much different fashion. But I don't have all the answers. And I, I'm much more willing, I think, today to recognize that. Um, our mutual buddy, Warren Bennis, asked me to, to follow up on that question with, with this. He said, I think that, he said, I think Howard is, is constantly learning and he is developing as a leader. And I've noticed that in the time that I've known him. He said, but I don't know how he learns. What, what, how do you learn? I mean, what, yeah. do you learn from failures? Do you learn from listening to people? Do you learn, well, how, what, what's the source of learning for, for, any, for a top executive? Well, first off, um, I am constantly calling on other people who are smarter and wiser than me to understand what they're doing and their perspective. So during the crisis, I was calling Warren I've, I was calling Jim Sinego, the founder of Costco, Les Wexner at The Limited, Mickey Drexler at, at J. Crew, Michael Dell, all of these people just trying to get something. And, and you never know who you're going to learn from. But I tell a great story in the front end of the book where I was in Milan and I walked into a cutlery store selling knives. Now, I, I, I view myself really as a merchant. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel a, a, a deep level of understanding about what it means to be a merchant. And I walked into this store, and this was the best merchandising I've ever seen of anything. And I want to meet the guy who runs it. And I find out this is a 100-year-old company, and it's the son of the founder, who's 85 years old right now, doesn't speak a word of English. And I said, can, you, can, I, can I meet him? And they said no. So I find someone I know in Italy to set up a meeting and the, found, the guy, Mr. Lorenzi, says, I'm going to give him 15 minutes. <laughs> so on a Saturday morning, I go see him, and I've got 15 minutes. Four hours later, I felt like I was at the, 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 feet, the foot of the Pope, the master. And there was a, a moment in time. He has one store. 
And he said to me, in Italian through the interpreter, how many stores do you have? And I was, I was so embarrassed. I wish I could have been there to translate for you. I was so embarrassed that I, I kind of whispered, 17,000. Yeah. And the interpreter said 17,000. And he says, what a country, America. <laughs> Now, when you talked about things that, that haven't changed with you, it was very clear from your talk and very clear from the book that one of those things is your values. And you talk about, as often as you use the word discipline, you use the word balance, and balance between profitability and preserving those values. Uh, you, know, you, you have done, your company has done, you know, uh, about as good a job as any large company in terms of ethical sourcing of your products, for example, trying to create healthier products, um, working for uh, environmental sustainability of, uh, in terms of the, 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 the packaging of the, of the goods and all that, that, that you've done. It, but as good a job as you've done, you still aren't there yet in all those things. What are, in, in, in regard to that sort of social part of the mission, uh, what are your long-range goals? Where, where, do, where do you want to go in that, uh, in, in, in that regard? Is there still a lot more to do? There's, what yeah. is there to do? I think there's a tremendous amount we, can, we, we need to do and I want to do. Uh, but I also realize that we've, we can't do everything we want to do at the time we want to do it. You know, we just had, in every market that I'm in, we have a company-wide meeting. And we just had one two hours ago. And it, there's a Q&A session. And after people ask me some very good questions, I say, I want you to stop asking questions and tell me what you're concerned about, what we're not doing well. Tell me. Give me a complaint. And, and, and all of a sudden, you get one question, and then it opens up. And we're not a perfect company. And we have to do more. Now, there's lots of things that we have in front of us that we have to solve. We have a new one. That's the cost of coffee. Now, I'll get to the answer to your question. But the cost of coffee right now is at an all-time high over the last 20 years. And it's a $200 million problem that we have for fiscal 12 if it stays at this level. Now, we have, to, we have to navigate through that. At the same time, I want to provide a new level of tuition reimbursement for every Starbucks person. Mm -hmm. And I know what that cost is. At the same time, there's other things that we want to do uh, in terms of total pay at Starbucks. We're buying coffee from 30 producing emerging countries. We're involved in the immunization of children of building schools, of microloans. We're deeply involved with the government of Rwanda in recreating their coffee industry post a genocide. Mm. These things cost an extraordinary amount of money. And so, and these, all these choices, and at the same time, you got Wall Street every day. And the mentality of the street, unfortunately, is not long term. So the balance that we have to try and create is sequencing all of this and also not trying to create expectations we can't meet. At the same time, I want to create a company that our people go home at night and are extraordinarily proud of. But most importantly, they trust the leadership of the company to do the right thing, even if we can't do everything when they want it. You know, in, in that regard, Howard, the thing that really knocked me out when I read your book, because I hadn't heard about this before, was when you took the 11,000 people down to New Orleans after Katrina, and of course you, you were in the midst of the crisis at that, at that time, that everybody down there took a full day out to do community service. I mean, you gave them 11,000 human hours of uh, volunteer activity. Right. Now that must have been hard as hell to justify uh, you know, in, the, in the middle of all this, this to, to do that. Was that a tough decision for you? To it was not a tough decision. In fact, it was, it was one of the easiest decisions we made. And, and I think we, we, we evaluated the conference by surveying everybody who went. And the number one thing that came back in terms of what meant the most to people was not the talk that I gave or all the things we did during those three days. What came back is the opportunity to serve others and what it meant to them that during this crisis we would think about other people other than ourselves. And I think we all have to remember something. That is that it's not only about ringing the register. And I think for those people who, who, who maybe don't want to embrace this as much, let me say it this way. It's good business. It's good business to do the right thing, and it will come back to you. 
One of the other sort of right things that you seem to be doing now, um, you, you mentioned towards the end of the book what I think you call lean management. It's yeah. what um, most of us for years have called um, employee involvement, high, high employee involvement. Um, how is that working out for you? Yeah. What, what, what's, what's the benefit of that employee involvement? Yeah. Well, in terms of lean, I, I, I want to say something. that I, I was not a believer in this, and I resisted it. Just like I, I, I'm an anti-consultant person. Mm -hmm. If there's any consultant, I'm sorry. I just feel like our people should have the answer. Uh, what lean brought to us was the ability to create operational excellence behind the counter to serve the customer better and create more efficiency. And once we understood it and cracked the code, we got extraordinary leverage out of this and began literally to save money. But it was never at the expense of the customer. And again, empowering our people to be able autonomously in their store and in their district to do this on their own once they had the tools was, a, was just magic. Okay. I'm going to ask you a dirty question now. Dirty question. Yeah. You know, Jim Senegal is doing this at Costco for years. For 40 years, people have been doing this. Why did it take you so long at Starbucks to wake up to that? Hmm? Uh, I think that we were guilty of talking to ourselves. We were guilty of believing our own press clippings. And as I said in the earliest part of this conversation, the success of the company became a disease. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that will never happen again. You know, as honest as you are with yourself, we in business education have to be honest with ourselves. And the truth is, we haven't done a great job uh, in business education over the last few years either. We're part of the, as much part of the problem as we've been part of the solution. Uh, a lot of schools, like particularly here at, at Daniels, we are working very, very hard to come up with uh, an MBA curriculum for the future. Mm -hmm. And as you look at, at what business schools are producing today, what advice could you give us in terms of, of our curriculum? Are there some things that we're doing we shouldn't be doing? Uh, are there some things that we should be, uh, should be stressing that we're not stressing? Uh, are there some uh, areas of subject matter that we should really be addressing more than, than we have in the past? I mean, what, how, how can we benefit from what, what, you know, what, what you have learned so that we can ultimately help that next generation to be a success? You know, one of the dangers of sitting here is that you, you're put in a position where you've got to have all the answers to every question. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't have the, all the answers, but w what I would say just, you know, off the cuff, I did not go to business school. I don't have a business degree. Uh, although I did speak at Harvard last week. <laughs> and I, I, there was a little part of me where I just felt, you know, I'm at Harvard. Cool. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I don't want to give a glib answer because I think it's a very important mm -hmm. question. Um, I suspect, you know, that the kids today that are going to school, uh, I don't know if they want to build a career or they want to get rich. And getting rich and pursuing money uh, is not a very fulfilling uh, journey if, if it's not integrated with what, really what the divine purpose should be. And what I would say is that no matter what class a business student is attending, it has to be balanced and integrated with the cause and the effect of why you're here. Mm. It's not to get rich. Mm. It's to create a better life for others. And if you can do that and be successful at the same time, you've really achieved something. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's very important for us here. Um, just. One thing that I would like to say in conclusion is that, you know, of course, the test of all the transformation you did is, you know, what's happening in the stores. And uh, having just read the book, this morning I went over to our local Starbucks at the corner of Yale in Colorado, and uh, we ordered my uh, cappuccino. I like a dry double cappuccino. And um, how was it? Not only was it fantastic, but Chelsea, my barista, said, check this, Jim. And she says, is it right? And I said, I think it's right. She says, hold it. You just think it's right. She said, let me make you another one. She says, I take great pride in what I am, in what I am doing. And I said to myself, you know, if Howard Schultz was here, he'd be really proud. I'd be. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the, so congratulations yeah. to you. And on behalf of the Institute for Enterprise Ethics and on behalf of the Daniels College of Business at the University of Denver, I want to thank you for taking Thank you all very much. Today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, you got a present for you. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.